want to do a quick little explanation of what the greatest integer function is. We can write this symbolically as f of x equals, and then we use square brackets for the greatest integer of x. We can also, in some textbooks, when they write the square brackets, they'll put a second line in there, and, and those both show the greatest integer of x. The greatest integer is also called the floor function, and you'll see why in just a second. So, what does greatest integer mean? It means, tell me what the greatest integer of the number I've given you is. So, the greatest integer of 1, well, that's just 1. And the greatest integer of 2 is just 2. The greatest integer of 3 is 3. I could keep doing this forever. I can go back in the negative direction. The greatest integer of negative 1 is negative 1. If I put these points on my graph, it's just going to be a series of solid dots on the points that I would use for the line y equals x. The difference comes when I get in between these points. If I'm looking for a greatest integer, the greatest integer of 1.1 is 1. The greatest integer of 1.4 is also 1. The greatest integer of 1.7 is also 1. I kind of think of it like dollars. If you had a dollar and ten cents, how many bills would you need for that? You'd need one dollar. A dollar and forty cents, that's one dollar bill. A dollar and seventy cents, that's also one dollar bill. If I look at that on a number line, it means the greatest integer of one is one. Of 1.1 1 .1 goes back to one. Of 1 1.4 goes back to one. 1.7 goes back to one. So this is called a floor function because the, the lowest number or the biggest, the greatest whole integer in 1.7 is 1. So the greatest integer of a number is always less than or equal to that number because you're always going to the left on a number line. So if I were to plot these things on my number line over to my two-dimensional graph, the greatest integer of 1.1 is 1. 1.4, 1.7, it's going to make a little bar here. It's not until we get to 2 that I'm going to jump up to my next part. So we also call this a step function because this looks like little steps. Next to each of the solid points is a bar. There's a solid point, a bar that goes to the right, and then an open circle at the end that will line up with the closed circle of the point above it. So if I keep going to the left and I can fill my whole graph, you'll notice something strange starts to happen on the left. If I look at some greatest integer functions for a negative number, the greatest integer of negative 1.1, if I have to go back to the greatest integer within it, that's negative 2. I also think of this like if you owed someone a dollar and ten cents and you had to pay off your debt, how much would you have to pay them if you only had bills? You'd have to pay them two dollars in bills. So you can see these go backwards. The greatest integer of negative 1.9 also going to go backwards to negative 2. We always go to the left. To give some more information about this function, the domain of this function, well the domain means what is x allowed to equal. I can take the greatest integer of any number. So x is an element of the real numbers. I could write in set notation. Or in interval notation, I can say from negative infinity to infinity with parentheses in between is the domain for the greatest integer function. The range is the possible y values of my function. As I look up and down, I notice I have gaps. These steps are not connected vertically. So the output of my greatest integer function is always an integer. It's never going to be a little fraction or a decimal, only a nice whole number with a plus or a minus in front of it. Well, in math, we don't like to write the whole word integers. I could write y is an integer. The letter that represents the integers in math is C because of the German word for integers. In the parentheses notation, the interval notation, I, I can't really write this very nicely. 
So it's easiest to just use the set notation for it. This may seem kind of strange, but it really has some practical uses. I think of it like our red box function. If I were to make a graph of some red box rentals, as soon as I take that DVD out of the machine, so I've rented it zero days, whoops, not down there. As soon as I take it out, it costs a dollar and 20 cents. Now, if I keep the machine for one hour, two hours, three hours, four hours, all the way up until the deadline of when it's due, it's going to cost me $1.20. Once I've exceeded my one-day allotment for Redbox, the cost jumps up to $2.40. I show that by putting an open circle at the end of this first bar and then jumping up to the second one. If I've rented it for one and a half days all the way up to two days, it's going to cost me $2.40. I'll never hit any of the values in between. You don't spend $1.70 at Redbox. It's either $1.20 if it's one day, $2.40 if it's for two days, $3.60 if it's for three days, and so on. Uh, some other things that would work this way are the number of stamps you put on a letter. How much it costs to mail a letter will go up depending on the number of ounces. It costs the same amount to weigh something uh, 1.7 ounces as 1.8 ounces. When you get to 2 ounces, you need a next stamp. Uh, or weight classes in wrestling. These are all examples of the greatest integer function, and hopefully you can be more comfortable with it now.